Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's been a, a wonderful conference. I've, I've enjoyed uh, all the talks, uh, all the talks so far. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've enjoyed uh, my first visit to Singapore, and it's a real privilege to take part in uh, the celebration of Charlie's 65th birthday. Um, one, just before I get started, I was thinking that, uh, you know, listening to Marco's talk and, and palindromes, um, at the recent uh, Comrade Torrance 2018 uh, meeting in Arco, Italy, I gave the very first talk in the conference. Here I'm giving the very last talk in the conference. It seems to have a certain palindromic aspect to it. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk today about uh, repairing shares in uh, threshold schemes. So this is a problem that's motivated by um, cryptography, but it's really a combinatorial problem. I, I've worked on a lot of problems like that over, over the years. I, I like to see the, uh, some kind of motivation that has an application, but then, then work on the combinatorial aspect of it. And many of the talks here kind of follow the same uh, theme. So I'll begin with a, uh, a very brief uh, introduction to threshold schemes. This is actually not very relevant for the rest of the talk, but just to establish a little bit of uh, background. So there's this notion of a TN uh, threshold scheme, and uh, T and N are positive integers, T is less than or equal to N, T is the threshold, and the idea is that there's some a secret K which comes from a, maybe it's an element in a finite field, and it's split into N shares denoted S1 through SN, and there are two properties. Uh, if you have any T out of the N shares, you can reconstruct the secret, but if you have T minus one or fewer shares, you don't have any information at all about the secret. It could be any of the possible uh, values that the secret could take on. So this, this notion of a threshold scheme was introduced independently at roughly the same time by uh, Bob Blakely and, and Adi Shamir, 1979. Uh, Shamir's threshold scheme is, uh, is uh, a very simple way to build these schemes for any values of T and N you, you like. Uh, it's based on polynomial interpolation over uh, ZP or over any finite field, actually. And uh, it's really a Reed-Solomon code in disguise, using the erasure properties of a Reed-Solomon code. So basically what you do is there's, uh, oh, and I should say that these, these shares and the secret are going to be uh, determined initially by some external participant called a dealer. Okay, so the, there are n non-zero elements of the field, and these are denoted uh, x1 through xn. They're distinct, they're non-zero. Uh, every, every user in the network has one of them. And uh, this is public information. And when, the, at some point in time, when the dealer wants to share a particular secret K, uh, what the dealer does is choose a random polynomial of degree at most T minus one. Uh, it's random subject to the condition that the constant term is K. And the shares then are just evaluations of the polynomial at these specified points Xi. And uh, then it's very easy to see that this works. If you have T shares, then you have T points on a polynomial of degree T minus one. You can determine the polynomial by uh, Lagrange interpolation, for example, and then read off the constant term, which is the secret. And it's not hard to prove that if you only have T minus one shares, then those shares are compatible with any possible value of the secret. Okay. So this is just to establish a little bit of background. So said it's actually not very relevant to, to the rest of the, the talk. Okay, so what I'm interested in today is uh, repairability. And uh, so we have a TN threshold scheme. It could be any TN threshold scheme, but it you know, might as well be the Shamir scheme for our purposes. And what we want to do is we want to have a protocol that will allow uh, a subset of users to repair the use the share of another user in the event that that user loses their share. So that's the scenario that we're looking at. So there's no dealer here anymore. The dealer sets up the scheme and goes away. Now they're just the end, end users. One of the users loses their share. The rest of the users want to help that user repair it. 
and it want and you want to do it in a secure way, meaning that th th there's no uh, extra information revealed that shouldn't be revealed, uh, roughly speaking. Okay, so um, we're going to assume that pairs of users can communicate securely, um, and this is a problem that has received some study by different research groups using different uh, techniques. I'm aware of at least three different techniques that, that people have, have looked at. Uh, there's something called an enrollment scheme, which a, a graduate student of mine proposed. There's a, a large literature on things called secure regenerating codes, uh, which can be used, some of which can be used to do repairing in threshold schemes. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a very combinatorial approach uh, that uh, my long-time uh, research collaborator, Ru Zhang Wei, and I uh, worked on. This paper was published earlier this year in uh, Discrete Math. And this, I'll also mention a survey of the different techniques uh, that, was, that also appeared this year by uh, Talia Lang and, and myself. So I'm going to focus on these uh, combinatorial uh, schemes. Okay, so now we're going to introduce uh, one additional parameter, uh, D, so this is sometimes called the uh, repairing degree, and this denotes how many users you need in order to repair share. So um, it may be equal to T, or it may be different than T. Um, in, the, in the first, I'm going to do a more general version later on, but for now, I'm going to say that um, you know, certain subsets of users uh, send a message to the user whose share is being repaired. These messages should allow that user to reconstruct their share. And the, the first thing that we can observe is that this parameter D has to be at least T. And if you think about it for a moment, suppose D was less than T, then that means that a set of fewer than T users could create another share and then they would have enough information to compute the secret, but they can't. So whatever this repair, repairing degree is, it has to be at least T. Okay. So uh, whatever D is, it has to be at least T. Can, uh, is this microphone working properly? Or? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> so the, the combinatorial approach that I'm uh, going to discuss here has uh, two ingredients. So one ingredient is a, a base scheme, uh, which uh, will be a threshold scheme, and then I have something that I'm going to call a distribution design. So this is going to be some kind of a combinatorial design. And the basic idea here is that users get sets of shares, they get multiple shares um, from a larger threshold scheme, and um, they have to be distributed in a very, very carefully according to a distribution design that satisfies certain thresholds. This is a really old idea. It goes back um, at least uh, 30 years, uh, but, but this particular application is, is a nice application of this idea. So I'm going to focus on three problems here. Um, so I, I said we have a distribution design. Uh, what properties do we require in order to end up with a T and D repairable threshold scheme? Um, I'm going to look at the question of scalability. So when we have a particular distribution design that's accommodating a fixed number of users, we would like to be able to accommodate a variable number of users using the same design. So the question is, well, when and how can we do that? And the third question is, is reliability. So we can think of a scenario where the users are available or not available with a certain probability and we ask, well, what's the probability then that a successful repair can be carried out? So it's kind of a network reliability problem, so, so maybe it fits the, uh, the topics of this conference, because Charlie's an expert in this topic, and, and I know virtually nothing about it. But I know enough just to prove a couple things here. Okay, so I'm going to begin with an example. Most of this talk is going to be examples, and uh, I'm not going to uh, state the general theorems, but I just kind of want to illustrate the idea using examples. So this is going to be a construction uh, for a uh, 2, 12, 3 repairable threshold scheme. So we're building a, a threshold scheme for 12 users that has a threshold of 2, and the repairing degree is going to be 3. And 
so we have this distribution design. So here's this distribution design. Well, this is a Steiner triple system of order nine. Right? So there's nine points and there's 12 blocks here. And there's one block associated with each of the 12 users. And we have a two out of 12 threshold scheme. So there are 12 shares. So the blocks basically indicate which shares are given to which user. So every user is going to get three shares. So user one gets the first, second, and third share. User two gets the fourth, fifth, and sixth share, etc. All right, so this is just recording or keeping track of which users get which shares. And I should emphasize that these numbers here inside the blocks, these are indices of the shares. Right? The shares are secret numbers, but everybody knows which shares are held by which users. Okay, so we have a, a threshold scheme with 12 users, or 12, 12 shares, and various subsets of these shares are going to be, uh, sorry, there are, are, are uh, nine shares, and we have 12 subsets corresponding to the 12 uh, users. So the, the base scheme here is a five out of nine threshold scheme, uh, and the question is, well, what, we have a threshold of five in the base scheme, and I'm claiming that we end up with a threshold of two in the scheme that we're constructing. So what's the relationship between uh, the this threshold of five and this threshold of two? So that's what I have to uh, explain next. Okay, so if we look at two blocks in the distribution design, well, these are two blocks in a Steiner triple system. They contain at least five points. They, either they're disjoint or they intersect at a point. So they contain five or six points. So they have at least five points. One block only has three points. Okay, so that, that's it. That's, that's the argument. Because two users, when they combine their shares, if I look at two users, say U1 and U2, well, let's say U1 and U4, they have uh, five different shares from the underlying base scheme. Okay, so five is the threshold in that scheme, so they have enough sufficient number of shares to reconstruct the secret. But one user by themselves only has three shares, the, sh the threshold is five, they don't have enough information. Okay, so this is the combinatorial property that says that it will, that, that it will work that if we set the threshold to be five in the base scheme, we construct something that has a threshold of two. Okay, so that, that's the, the, the combinatorial property that makes this, this work out. Okay, is that clear? All right, now what about repairability? So the reason why this method is uh, potentially uh, useful is that you can uh, repair shares just by giving these appropriate subshares uh, to, to each other. So for example, if you have user U1 and they lose their share. So we want to be able to repair this share. So user 1 has three subshares, namely subshare number 1, 2, and 3 from the, from the 5 out of 9 threshold scheme. So all he has to do is find uh, some user that has the first subshare some user that has the second subshare, and some user that has the third subshare. So he could contact U4 and ask for the first one, U8 ask for the second one, and U12 ask for the third one. There are lots of choices that could be made. So this is the repairing process. It's just transmit these subshares from someone who has them, or from a, a, a group of people who have them, to, to the person who loses their share. So the repairing degree is, is three because there are three subshares and this user will ask three different users uh, for these three values. Okay, so it's very simple. All right. So I, I mentioned I was going to discuss different, uh, different problems. One of the problems, uh, which kind of I think is a natural problem, is this uh, scalability question. So this is a scheme uh, for 12 users. Why 12? Because 12 is the number of blocks in the distribution design. Okay, well, what if you don't have 12 users? Maybe you only have 10 users or 11 users or, or, or whatever. Well, the obvious thing to do is to use a subset of the 12 blocks. Just throw a couple of them away. Don't bother using them. And then the, then the question is, well, this doesn't affect the threshold property at all. 
but maybe it will affect the repairability. What do you need to do in order to be able to repair? You need to know that there's someone else who has each subshare that you lost. So in the entire design, you need at least two copies of each subshare. So it gets really easy to, uh, to uh, analyze this. So um, what we can do then is we could, if we wanted to have a scheme for fewer than 12 users, what we could do is by begin by choosing two parallel classes out of the design. That will ensure that every subshare is there twice. And then we can use any additional blocks that, that we want. So we have each subshare there twice or, or more than that. That's enough to ensure that you can repair. So whenever someone loses a share, they know there's someone else who, who has each of the subshares that they lost. So I'm, I uh, call this a basic repairing set. So here we just take two um, resolution classes. So these the first three blocks form a, a parallel class or resolution class, so do the next <coughs> To. So this is kind of the minimal configuration that works. And then you can add on to that any, any additional blocks that you want. So in this particular design, you can accommodate any number of users between uh, 6 and 12. And so that, that kind of answers this question of, well, can we, can we scale this for different numbers of users? Okay, so uh, I did an example. In, in general, then, we want to find a distribution design, uh, so say that we want to construct something that, uh, that will have threshold T. Then in the distribution design, this is the property that we require. We want the number of points in the union of any T blocks to be greater than the number of points in the union of any T minus one blocks. And this means that we can set a threshold. The threshold would be the, the minimum number of points in the union of any T blocks, and we can set that threshold in the base scheme, and then in the scheme that we're constructing, we'll end up with a threshold of T. So this is the property that we require. So we need some kind of a, a design, or more generally, some kind of a set system that satisfies this property. Okay, this is kind of an unusual property. Um, I'm not aware that this property has, has been studied. If someone is aware, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in references. So what we've been doing is just looking at some kind of natural classes of designs where we can uh, prove uh, statements of this form just by doing appropriate counting. All right, now for scalability, um, well, we, we basically, what I've said already is, is can be generalized. Once you have a distribution design, you just identify a subset of blocks such that this subset of blocks contains every point at least twice. That's a basic repairing set, and then you can add blocks to that as you like. And in, in when you start with a resolvable design, all you need to do is take two resolution classes as your basic repairing set to get started. Okay. So um, I did an example with the Steiner triple system. Let's uh, maybe take a a natural class of designs to look at, and that is uh, projective planes. So projective planes will uh, allow us to construct repairable schemes with uh, various sizes of, of thresholds because we can, we can count um, the number of blocks, or the number of points in the union of, of uh, T blocks or T minus one blocks. We can get bounds on these uh, in a very straightforward way. So. We need to know that if we take a certain number of blocks, what's the largest number of points that they contain, what's the smallest number of points that they can contain. So if I have uh, T minus one blocks, or lines in the projected plane, what's the largest number of points that they could contain? Well, if you think about that for like uh, half a second, you'll, you'll come to the conclusion that you take your lines to be collinear. And that covers the maximum number of points. Okay, so when you do that, this is the formula you get. You get Q times uh, Q plus one points on the first line. The other T minus two lines each contribute Q additional points, and, and this is the total number of points you get. So this is the maximum number of points that you can cover with uh, T minus one lines. All right? 
So this is our elementary counting. The next one is, is almost as elementary. What's the minimum number of points that T lines will cover? So you think about that for a minute. We have one line, the next line intersects it. You, sh you, should, you would take the third line to intersect both of the first two in different points. You take the next line to intersect each of the first three in different points. All right, so you can continue that. So, you, so every time you add on a new line, uh, you're getting uh, one less new point than you did before. So it's this sum here which evaluates to this. And phrasing this geometrically, the minimum occurs when uh, no three of the lines are collinear, uh, or you could say it, that it's the dual of a TR. Okay, so this is the minimum number that's co of points covered by T lines. All right, so we had a, a number, this quantity here, Q, T minus 1 plus 1, we want this to be less than this number here. So for a fixed value of Q, this will be, this inequality will be satisfied for certain values of T up to some point, and then, and then it will no longer be true. Okay, so let's look at an example just to, to have some numbers to, to play with. So if I have a projective plane of order five, well, one block contains six points. Uh, any two blocks will contain 11 points. Three blocks will contain at least 15 and at most 16 points. Four blocks will contain at least 18 and at most 21 points, uh, et cetera. Five blocks will contain at least 20 points. So these are just plugging the numbers into the formulas that I had before. So, I, with, so with these uh, bounds then, I can decide, well, what kind of thresholds can I build in the resulting repairable threshold scheme? So five is, or sorry, six is less than 11, right? So that means that threshold two is fine. Uh, there's, I have at least 11 points in two blocks. I have at most six points in one block. If I look at threshold three, well, that's also okay because I have at least 15 points in three blocks. I have 11 points in two blocks. Threshold four is also okay. I could use that because I have at least 18 points in four blocks and at most 16 points in three blocks. Okay, you can see these gaps are getting closer and closer. When I get to t equals five, uh, this technique no longer works because five blocks um, contain at least 20 points, but four blocks can already contain uh, 21 points. So the inequality that I need is, is no longer satisfied. So using a projective plane of order five, I can build a repairable threshold scheme with threshold two, three, or four. Okay, so, uh, and, and as you look at larger orders, you'll be able to get uh, a larger variety of thresholds in, in the scheme you construct. All right, so that's just an, an illustration of how you can you could use um, a class of designs and you could do the appropriate counting and, and figure out when when this technique can be, be applied. All right. Um, now there's the I mentioned this notion of a of a basic repairing set. So we want to identify a subset of blocks so that every point is present at least twice. So I said, well, if you have a resolvable design, you just take two resolution classes, and, and that's optimal, and you're done. Okay, well, on a projected plane, that's going to be difficult. There are no parallel lines to begin with. So what we want is, uh, we are actually, what we're looking for is actually the dual of a two-blocking set. So it's, it's something that has been studied uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, finite geometry. A nice paper on this is the one by uh, Bala Blockus from 1996. Uh, they have lots of uh, different constructions. You know, here are two simple, well-known constructions from their paper. You can begin with any three non-collinear points, X, Y, and Z, and take all the lines that contain at least one of these points. This gives you a basic repairing set of size uh, 3Q. Uh, really what you would prefer to have is something closer to 2Q, and you can get closer by using this other construction. Whenever Q is the square of a prime, you can take two 
disjoint bare subplanes in the Desarzia projective plane, and then take all the lines that contain a line from either of these two subplanes. If you do the counting, uh, you get 2 times q plus root q plus 1. So it's roughly 2q with a little bit of extra stuff. So this is, this is closer to, to what, you would, uh, what, what you would want. And of course, there's lots more information about two blocking sets in this paper. It's a, it's a fairly big subject with, uh, with a, lot of, uh, a lot of known results. So I'm really here, I'm just quoting some known results, which, which uh, help to, to answer this problem of, of what would a basic preparing set in a projective plane look like. Okay, so the, the combinatorial problem that arose is one where you, you just have to look at the literature and, and see what the, the answer is. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of this talk by looking at, uh, at another class of designs, uh, namely uh, quadruple systems. So now, uh, instead of a two design, we, we have a three design. And uh, so, you know, why might we do this? Um, uh, and uh, then what could we, how might these three designs be better than two designs for the problem? And uh, I'm also going to look at these different classes of designs in this uh, uh, context of, of the re reliability of the, of the system or the network that we're constructing. So first of all, just a little bit of motivation for why you might want to use a uh, three design. Well, it might make repairing more efficient because if you have a, a three design, uh, then you're going to have blocks that intersect in uh, two points. And so we have four points in each block. When you want to repair someone's share, they could get two of the subshares from one user and the other two subshares from another user. So you'd only have to contact two other users instead of four. Okay, so that would be, that would be one uh, you know, possible advantage of, of using these. Uh, there's less communication that takes place. Uh, it doesn't change the amount of information that's communicated, but it reduces the number of transmissions. Uh, but there's also some advantages in terms of, of reliability, which is what I'm going to be uh, discussing next. Oh, uh, let's also observe that, yeah, this is a possible candidate for distribution design, at least for threshold two, because two blocks will contain at least six points, one block contains four points, so if the base scheme has threshold six, then I will end up constructing a threshold scheme with threshold two. And now the repairing degree is, is two because of what I already said, you can get two subshares from one user and two subshares from another user. Okay, so let's, um, let's look, uh, okay, well this is just illustrating what I said. Um, so here is, here's A1, A1 loses their share, they want to repair it, so they could, for example, contact B1 to get the first two subshares and contact B7 to get the last two subshares. There are many other combinations that would work as well. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, the reliability question, and I'll look at that for the uh, balancing complete block designs as well as for the, the quadruple systems. So the, the model we're looking at is um, that users in this network may be available or not. And the, the simplest model is to assume that every user is available with some probability P and therefore unavailable with probability one minus P, which will denote by Q, and that all of these availabilities of, of nodes are independent of each other. So this is kind of a very simple reliability model. And the, the, what we're interested in answering is, well, what's the probability that a successful repair can be carried out in this, in this model? Okay, so that I'm going to denote by R of P. So that's the probability that there's at least one set of available users who can repair a given share. Uh, we could also look at the expected number of repairing sets that are available. And I'm going to confine my attention to, to minimal repairing sets. You know, if, if, if three users can repair a share, then uh, any uh, superset of those three users can also repair the share. But that's not particularly interesting. So we're just going to here focus on minimal repairing sets. So these are what you might call reliability polynomials. 
we can express these in terms of the variable p or q equivalently by, by this substitution. So I want to uh, derive some, some formulas for these things. So let's, let's look first at balanced incomplete block designs with lambda equals 1. Um, the counting I'm going to do won't work very well if lambda is bigger than 1. So I'm just going to restrict to lambda equals 1 here. So the, the, the scenario we've, we've been discussing all along is that we, we have a, a user, they, have, they correspond to a block, these are the indices of the subshares that they need. Of course, every point is in v minus 1 over k minus 1 blocks. And for a given point or subshare, there are minus 1 other users who have that particular subshare. So let's call that u of, of x i. So, the, so basically, user u l needs to be able to contact one user from this set u of x1 one user from the set u of x2, et cetera. And they're disjoint uh, because uh, lambda is equal to 1. So in the, the 931 design the, that I uh, mentioned initially, so let's look at user 1. Uh, need subshares 1, 2, and 3. So the ones, are, the ones are red. So there are three blocks that contain that subshare. So u4, u7, and u10 comprise this set u1. Uh, the three users who have the second subshare, two, they're user U5, U8, and U11, so that's the set U2. And there are three users who have the third subshare, U3, so that set U3 is U6, U9, and U12. All right, so in order to be able to repair the share, you need one available user from, at least one available user from each of these three sets. Okay, so th this is something that's fairly easy to, to compute the, the probability now. So if I focus on a particular set, uh, what's the probability that at least one user is available? So it's 1 minus the probability that they're all unavailable. So 1 minus q cubed. And we have three sets. Uh, so the probability is just the product or the, uh, the product of these three terms. So it's 1 minus q cubed q. So that is, the, that is the probability that there's at least one set that can repair a given share. So it's, it's pretty straightforward in this case. And if, we're look, if we are interested in the expected number of minimal repairing sets, well, that's even easier. You just kind of count how many combinations there are and multiply by p cubed by using linearity of expectation. So it's 27 p cubed in this case. And you can quickly generalize these formulas to any VK1 DIVD. So this, this first computation was for the triple system on nine points. But in general, it's going to be 1 minus Q to the R minus 1 to the power K. So this cubed here is R minus 1. And the second cubed is, is K, the block size. And the expected number of uh, minimal repairing sets is r minus 1 to the k times p to the k. So for, for BIBDs, um, it's pretty easy to, to work out what these polynomials are. But things get more uh, interesting when you look at, when you go to quadruple systems. Uh, so, it, so it is more complicated here. So what, what makes it more complicated? Well, there are different kinds of repairing sets. Um, and I already observed that you can have, it's possible to get two shares from one user and two shares from another user, and you're done. But there are other kinds of, of minimal repairing sets. Maybe you get two users, two shares from one user, one share from a third, and one share from a fourth. Uh, maybe you get the four shares from four different users. So you have to uh, consider all the different possibilities. So how are, so this you know rapidly becomes more complicated to figure out, and um, this notion of a of a cut uh, gives you a, a nice way to kind of systematically figure out what the possibilities are, and it, it in the end it just turns into inclusion exclusion. Uh, so the definition of a cut is a minimal set of users with the per, with the property that repairing is impossible if all the users in the cut are unavailable. So when the cut fails, 
repairing fails. So what are the cuts here? The cuts are just the sets that I've already defined. If I look at all the users that have a particular subshare, that's a cut. If, if all the users in the cut are unavailable, that subshare is unavailable and you can't repair. So the, the cuts then are just these sets that I already defined, the, the other blocks that contain a fixed point. All right, now before, in the case of a BIBD with lambda equals one, these cuts were disjoint, they're no longer disjoint. But that actually doesn't complicate things uh, too much. Let's look at the, the smallest non-trivial quadruple design, um, quadruple system, and uh, we can identify the cuts here. So A1 is the block that's being, that we want to repair, the share that we want to repair. So I've, I've identified all the other blocks here that contain at least one point from A1. And uh, so there's some blocks that contain two points. I guess they all contain two points in this particular case. Uh, except for A2, which is disjoint. So the, the set U1, this is one of the cuts. So these are the blocks that contain one. So that's B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, and B6. U2 are the blocks that contain two. So it's B1, B2, B9, B10, B11, and B12, etc. So there's, there are four cuts. Each cut has six points in it. All right? Now, we want to compute this polynomial R of P, so we want to figure out the probability that at least one of these four cuts fails. So this is just inclusion, exclusion. So we have to count, we have to be able to we figure out the size of each cut, the size of the union of two cuts, the size of the union of three cuts, etc. And then we figure out how many combinations of each there are, and then you put it all together. Right? So there are six um, there are four cuts of size six. Uh, when you look at the union of two cuts, the union of two cuts is ten. So we're in, with the union of two cuts is saying how many blocks are there that contain, say, one or two or both? Well, there there are ten out of the out of these twelve uh, blocks. Okay, so the union of any two cuts is equal to has cardinality equal to ten. And the union of any three cuts is equal to 12. The union of four cuts is equal to 12. All right, so I'm just doing inclusion and exclusion here. So you just put this all together. We get four times Q to the six. These are the four cuts of size one. We get four choose two unions of two cuts, each of which has probability Q to the 10 of failing because there are 10 elements in it plus there are four choose three unions of three cuts, each of which has probability Q to the 12th of failing, and there's four choose four cuts, uh, unions of four cuts, and uh, so this is inclusion, exclusion, and then in the end we can just put this together and we get the formula for the polynomial. Okay, so this, this notion of a cut, which is one of, I guess, one of the standard um, techniques in network reliability, it, it gives us a nice straightforward way to compute this polynomial. All right, um, now, so what we have so far, I can just put this graph here to illustrate that you do get some advantage from um, looking at a three design as opposed to a two design. So we have tabulated here these polynomials for three designs. The red curve is for the uh, two thirty four one design. The blue curve is for the 2641 design. The black curve is for the quadruple system. This is a 31041 design. And uh, you know, the you can observe that well this it jumps up to one much more quickly than the others do. So even by once you get past point two, then this probability is already getting close to one. Whereas for the two designs, you have to get up to like point six or seven before you get close to one. So there is some potential advantage there in, in terms of the probability. Um, now what about the expected number? This turned out to be uh, surprisingly difficult, unless there's a simpler way that we didn't think about.
just be, it, it seems to divide up into a bunch of cases. So I'm going to turn to the 1041 design because this is the smallest design that illustrates the different uh, cases. And I'll just go through it quickly. I won't uh, you know, work out all the details. So this is the unique quadruple design on, on 10 points. And um, so the, the problem here is that um, I want to compute the expected number of minimal repairing sets. So a minimal repairing set could consist of two, three, or four blocks. And we kind of have to consider each case separately. Um, so if I, to begin with, uh, if I have a repairing set of size two, I get two points from one block and then the other two points from some other block. So for example, I'm repairing A0, I could get the one, two from one block. Uh, there are three other blocks I could choose. I could get the four, five from another block and there are three blocks I can choose. So there are nine combinations, uh, but I could do one, four, and two, five, and get another nine combinations. I could do one, five, and two, four, and get another nine combinations. So the 27 combinations all together, and this gives us uh, an expected number of 27 uh, p squared, because each combination of two blocks uh, will be available with probability p squared. So this is the expected number of repairing sets of size two. So if we, if we said, well, we're only interested in, in size two, uh, we'd be done. This is the answer. But, but maybe it's interesting to also consider repairing sets of size three and four. And uh, so for us, we look at a repairing set of size four that's minimal, then we need a block that contains one, but none of the other three and a block that contains two, but none of the other three, et cetera. Well, when you look at the design, there are, for each one of these points, like so for the point one, there are two blocks that contain a one, but, not, but none of two, four, and five. And similarly for each of those. So the number of combinations is two times two times two times two. So remember, we're only looking at minimal repairing sets of size four. If it had a one and a two in it, it wouldn't be minimal. That's the, the point here. Okay, so this gives us 16p to the fourth as the expected number. Okay, so that is also not too complicated. But then the last case, uh, and I won't we'll work through all the details, is what about a minimal repairing set of size three? And you look at that and you figure, well, there are different different configurations that would, could work. You could have a block that contains one, two, a block that contains one, four, and a block that contains one, five. That is a minimal repairing set of size three. So three intersecting pairs. You could have two intersecting pairs and a disjoint point, an isolated point. You could have um, a one pair and two isolated points. This would be one, two, four, five. And you have to count how many configurations there are of each type. And for each configuration, you have to count how many combinations there are. And then you have to multiply by p cubed, and you get 396 p cubed. And so the total of, of these three cases looks like this. So it, it, it's, it's more complicated. So um, I guess one of the things I don't know is you know, whether there's a you know, more straightforward way Oh, this was straightforward, but whether there's kind of a more concise way to, to obtain this, this number. Okay, so that is the, uh, that's where I'm going to uh, end. I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the open problems uh, that, that uh, are suggested by this work. Um, so I, I should say that we can compute the reliability polynomial, the, the probability that there's at least one repairing set for any T VK1 design. I showed you the formula for a 2VK1 design. We could generalize that to a, a T-VK1 design. Um, and it, it's, again, in, it's an inclusion-exclusion type uh, argument. Um, but when we look at the expected number of mineral repairing sets, uh, well, we have an easy formula for 2VK1 designs, and we have a more complicated formula for 3V41 designs that, that generalizes the example I did 
But as soon as you have a 3v5-1 design, the number of, of cases would seem to become a lot more complicated. So I don't, I don't know about that. Um, are there probabilistic existence results for good distribution designs? I think this is an interesting question. And uh, you know, some of the experts on probabilistic methods you know, maybe can say something. So it goes back to this property here that I, I mentioned uh, earlier. So if you want a set system uh, of some kind with the property, say, that the union of any T blocks is at least alpha, and the union of any T minus 1 blocks is at most beta, where alpha and beta are two specified parameters. Now, if I say that the union of T blocks is at least alpha, then this is very closely related to this uh, sparse hyper hypergraph problem that uh, Gennian was talking about. And that can be attacked by probabilistic methods. But the question is, you have this, ex this second property that you also need, the union of any t minus 1 blocks. You want to bound that above by some other parameter. So I think it would be very interesting if you could get some kind of probabilistic results on how many blocks you could have potentially have in such a set system. I have no idea how to do that. Um, the third problem on my list is what other kinds of combinatorial structures. I think you could use some kinds of codes nicely, so you don't have to use designs. So, so there are lots of other things to look at. One thing that is kind of interesting is that the base scheme does not have to be a threshold scheme. It can be a ramp scheme. And a ramp scheme basically has uh, two thresholds. One threshold allow, says how many shares you need to reconstruct the secret. The other threshold says the maximum number of shares you can have without having any information about the secret. And the, the reason why this can be useful is that if we go back to the um, projective plane case, there's a gap here between 6 and 11, 11 and 15, 16 and 18. The bigger this gap is, then the more efficiency you can get by using a ramp scheme, where you're measuring efficiency in terms of how much information you have to store. So there's a nice trick then that, that uh, says that, well, when the gap here is bigger than one, you can, you can exploit that by using a ramp scheme instead of a threshold scheme. Okay, so, so there is some interest in making that gap uh, as big as possible. And uh, finally, the... Um, Another kind of interesting related question is, I've just been discussing you know, how many repairing, or what's the probability that there's at least one repairing set? A kind of a practical question would be, well, how do you go about finding a repairing set uh, in, a, in, a, in a systematic and efficient way? And this is something that my, uh, my current graduate student, uh, uh, Bailey Paxmar, is, uh, is working on. And uh, so this is my last slide, the end. Uh, and it is the end, <laughs> and uh, happy birthday, Charlie, and uh, thank you. This is a scenario where we're assuming that all the participants are honest and and no one is trying to fool anybody else. So in, in, in secret sharing, yeah, there are any kind of a secret sharing scenario, you you can start asking questions about what if they're trying to to cheat each other in, in various ways. Um, but here I'm just I'm just kind of picking the you know, making the most uh, basic assumptions that everyone is, is honest and, and trying to figure out the you know, what are the mechanisms for carrying out a repair? Any other questions?